Hello, everybody, and welcome to Chestnut Level Presbyterian Church. You are seeing this sermon on Sunday morning, uh, July 30th, although we are recording it earlier because on July 30th, we will be at Muddy Run for our outdoor service followed by a church picnic. So for those of you unable to be with us in person and join with us up at Muddy Run, we want to invite you to uh, join with us online. Glad that you're watching us either on YouTube or on Facebook Live. And we pray that as we continue this summer sermon series on Red Hot Topics, that it will continue to feed your soul with the truth of God's word. I'm going to share a scripture reading with you. I'm going to dive into the sermon. That will also lead to scripture reading. And uh, again, pray for the riches of God's blessing to be upon you as you are watching this on Sunday, July 30th, or uh, later on even in the week. Our first scripture reading is from Colossians uh, chapter 1, very short passage, verses 15 through 17. Paul, writing, says this, he, meaning Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Thanks be to God for the reading and hearing of God's word. Well, several years ago on the old Tonight Show with Johnny Carson during his monologue, he was joking about the smog in Southern California. And he said, the air was so bad today. And of course, the crowd responded, how bad was it? He said, the air was so bad today that when I stepped out onto my front porch and took a deep breath, I chipped my tooth. Well, what isn't so funny is the air quality that has been rather rough this summer, and a lot of that has to do with the fires that have come down from Canada. Doctors' waiting rooms are filled with people who seem to have respiratory problems, even though they never took up smoking. How in the world did we get ourselves into such a mess? Well, this was the question that was asked by the originators of Earth Day when they started all this nature awareness all the way back in 1970. And they are still at it today. Think globally, act locally, they say on their bumper stickers. Our children march home from school and they grimly announce that in order for them to have any kind of a future at all, we're going to have to become charter members of the green generation. We're going to have to take recycling more seriously. We're going to have to take only three-minute showers, use more efficient light bulbs, and we're going to have to drive either hybrid or electric cars. We open up the newspaper and we read about endangered species, hazardous waste, and climate change. Going green seems to be all the rage these days. And it would seem to be for good reason. However you may feel about climate change or global warming, the scientific community is pretty unanimous that the actions of those living today will determine the quality of those babies being born this year. If you remember the movie 2012, the scenario that they painted was that the planet's temperature was soaring, the polar ice caps were melting, the seas were rising, the climate was changing, agricultural patterns were being disrupted, and food supplies were dwindling. In other words, this great repository of life, as we know it, seems to be in big trouble. And for those of us who are Christians, that should really be a concern for us. Because what is around us is not simply the environment or Mother Nature, but it is God's creation. And what is doubly troubling is when we hear that what got us into this big mess in the first place is the Christian faith. With the Bible, of all things, being the big culprit in this environmental crisis that we are in. 
And it all goes back to the doctrine of dominion that we find in Genesis chapter 1. Remember, God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. The belief being that God gave humans a blank check to do whatever we want, however we want, whenever we want to the creation. As Americans, it is said that we were only 4% of the world's population, and yet we use 25% of the world's resources. Could it be that we have done more than cash the check that God gave us? In fact, maybe the account is way overdrawn, and the bill has finally come due with all of these environmental problems. Well... Is it really that simple? Can we blame the Bible for smog spe uh, spewing smokestacks, hazardous waste, and unclean water? Or could it be that pressed within the pages of Scripture, we find insights and understanding that will save us from eco-catastrophe? Regardless of where you might be coming from on environmental issues, I do want to invite you to join with me as we look further into God's Word through green shaded glasses. Today's red hot topic, or should I say green hot topic, is the gospel in green. Let's talk for a few moments theology about ecology. And it only seems fitting that we look at the narrative of creation in chapter 1 of the book of Genesis. And so I want to invite you to join me as I read our second scripture, and it is from Genesis chapter 1, verses 20 through 25. Now, by way of introduction, verse 20 picks up on the fifth day of creation. So far, God has created the light, the sun and moon and stars. He separated the seas from the dry land and caused vegetation to spring forth from the earth until we get to verse 20. And here's what it says. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the, the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Friends, this too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me in a moment of prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, we do uh, thank you for these majestic uh, cadences that come out of Scripture and that remind us of your awesome glory and power. Come among us now and illumine these words so that we might be faithful stewards of the creation over which you have given us dominion and in which you have placed us to live our lives. And it's to the glory of Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen. Well, we know that God put everything on earth for a purpose. He said, let there be light. And it was good and had a purpose. And so it went through the sky and sea and the land and the plants and the trees. It all had a purpose. Now, we don't know why God put some creatures on this earth. Mosquitoes, for example. I have no idea why God put them there. Really? What is the purpose of a mosquito? It's just this nasty pest that sends me indoor scratching during these hot summer months. 
And we don't know why God made everything, but we do know that there is a purpose to it. For example, if I were to drive out to the Harrisburg airport and climb into the cockpit of a 747, there would be all kinds of buttons and levers and knobs on that instrument panel before me. Now, suppose we were to take off, and as we were flying at about 35,000 feet, I looked at one of those levers and said, you know, for the life of me, I have no idea what this is for. And what's this wire under here? It doesn't seem to be doing any good either. And I pulled them both out and got rid of them. What do you think would happen? I have a feeling I know what would happen. In just a few minutes, we would be spiraling towards earth, all singing together, near my God to thee. Well, one thing is for sure. The pilot knows why every one of those buttons and levers are there. And when God climbed into the cockpit of the cosmos, he pushed all the right buttons. And so, friends, I am really in no position to tell God that he made some creatures expendable just because they are an inconvenience and cramp my lifestyle. According to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, there is something like 434 endangered species in the United States alone. And it's mostly the glamour animals that grab all the headlines. Giant pandas, blue whales, tigers, the bald eagle. But plants make up more than half of the endangered species list. And yet when we think about plants or insects, our usual, usual response is, well, who cares? So what? Big deal. And yet, did you know that one-fourth of all the pharmaceuticals originated as wild plants? And so, hidden in the vegetation that is being bulldozed or burned up may be the very plant that God put on this earth for the purpose of curing cancer, heart disease, diabetes, or Alzheimer's. And when it's gone, it's gone forever. I remember that song, Big Yellow Taxi, from 1970. They paved paradise and put up a parking lot with a pink hotel, a boutique, and a swinging hotspot. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you got till it's gone? They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Friends, we need to remember that God's love extends to the non-human world that is also around us. Jesus died to redeem all of creation. John 3, 16 does not say, for God so loved only humans. It says, for God so loved the world that he sent his son. Now, as a pastor, one of the questions that I frequently get is, will I see my pet in heaven? Will my beloved pet make it through the pearly gates? Well, dogs, yes. Cats, no. I'm sure Lisa's disappointed to hear that. I'm just kidding. Uh, Psalm 36.6 says, You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. So that sure sounds pretty promising to pet owners, doesn't it? I believe that someday in heaven our feathered, furry, and fishy friends may chirp and bark and howl their glories and hallelujahs to the God who created them all. But what about us? Well, contrary to the opinion of some people, there is a hierarchy in creation because all of life is not of equal value. And unfortunately, there are people who believe that humans are of no more value than a tree or a bug. And we've heard about environmental extremists or animal rights activists who destroy laboratories, the very laboratories that are seeking cures for human diseases. One activist even said, man is a kind of cancer spreading across the globe. Well, Christianity elevates the human because we and we alone are created in the imago Dei, the image of God. And yet we still have to guard ourselves from going on some kind of ego trip in which we believe that we're the only thing that matters in the creation. 
Do we really believe that the only thing that matters to God is what he made in the afternoon on the sixth day? What do you think God was saying on those first five days at the end as he finished each day? Did God say, oops, oh, oops, oops? No, no. God said, it's good, and that's good, and that's good, and that's good. And so all that is to say is we are not the only show in town. There was a group of scientists who were studying an acre of forest. And what they discovered on this acre of forest that as humans, we are outnumbered by other creatures by about 125 million to one. And then they counted them. There were 50,000 vertebrates, toads, turtles, snakes, rodents, possums, raccoons, robins, sparrows, woodpeckers, crows, fish, and frogs. There were 124 million invertebrates. 89 million mites, 652,000 ants, 388,000 millipedes, 372,000 spiders, camping anyone? 90,000 earthworms, 45,000 termites, 19,000 snails, and other miscellaneous creepy crawler critters. Folks, we are outvoted, and that doesn't even include plant life. God made us to be in an interdependent relationship with the other parts of creation. And yet, how often is it true that what we do to nature, we wind up actually doing to ourselves? Some of you who are from around here remember Frank Rizzo, the gruff and tough former mayor of Philadelphia. Well, Frank Rizzo had absolutely no use for anybody concerned with the environment. He thought that they were all a bunch of tree-hugging, leftist, pointy-headed intellectuals, and those were the nice things he had to say. One day, Frank Rizzo's dog became seriously ill, and Frank Rizzo rushed his dog to a veterinary hospital in Philadelphia. And as hard as they worked to save that dog's life, his dog still died. And rough and tumble, Frank Rizzo broke down and cried when his dog died. And when he discovered what caused the death of his dog, he cried even more. The vet told him that what caused the dog's death were the chemicals in his lawn fertilizer. And then Frank Rizzo got mad. And at a press conference, he said, I don't think those environmentalists are crazy anymore. In fact, you're looking at one. You see, what we do to the environment, eventually, we do to ourselves. Now, I think I can read some of your minds out there. You may be thinking, well, John, I like it a whole lot better when you talk about Jesus. Well, friends, I want to let you know that I am talking about Jesus this morning. You heard before those wonderful words from the Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created. All things have been created through him and for him. And in him all things hold together. When you down a pill to cure an ache, look at the sunset of the beach, go for a hike at your cabin in the woods, or simply take a bite of an apple, you are admiring the handiwork of Jesus Christ, the Creator. We need people in this church, Chestnut Level, who are biblically responsible to get enthusiastically involved in environmental issues. We need to keep the, the sky blue, the earth green, and the water clean, because the God who holds the universe together is the same God who is also holding you and me. So, plant a garden to the glory of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, don't be a litter bug. Recycle your old computers and shout hallelujah. It was back on Christmas Day, 1968. The Apollo 8 astronauts were circling beside the dark side of the moon and beginning their return home. And over the moon's horizon, there suddenly appeared a blue and white earth, garlanded by the glistening light of the sun 
against the black void of space. And as they sent the people back home Christmas greetings, these sophisticated astronauts trained in science and technology did not quote Albert Einstein. They did not reach for the immortal words of William Shakespeare. Only one thing could capture the wonder of that moment. Millions of people back on Earth heard the voice from space as an astronaut read, In the beginning, God. The only word that could encompass the magnificence of that spectacle was God who created the heavens and the earth. God who made the heavens and the earth, who made the deepest sea, God who put the stars in the place, is the God who cares for you and me. May we be good and conscientious stewards over the environment and over all that God has made. Would you join me in prayer? Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, only you are worthy to receive honor and glory and power and dominion, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of power and might, for heaven and earth are filled with your glory. And so we bow before you in awe, wonder, and gratitude for giving us dominion over the beauty and bounty of your world. In all our actions, help us to make wise decisions for the sake of the coming generations as we rule over your creation. It's through Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen. We'll see you next week. <laughs>